Hello and welcome to this third video in Stevenson's Purpose in the Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Our focus today is on the descriptions of London and how London itself is a metaphor for society in England at the time. So throughout the story, respectability is doubled with degradation and degradation is where things get morally worse. Abandon, that idea that you should just give in to all your desires, is coupled with restraint. Honesty is contrasted with duplicity and lying. Even London itself has a dual nature, as we'll see, with its respectable streets existing side by side with areas notorious for their squalor and violence. And people who lived in the respectable areas would very often move into these areas of squalor and violence. And that leads to the kind of hypocrisy that Stevenson is attacking in the men in this story. Let's take a quick look at this map of Victorian uh, London, 1889, just a few years after um, this book's published. And it's a map of poverty. And what you can see is the darker areas are areas of poverty, and the red areas are areas of prosperity. I'm colorblind, unfortunately, so the upper middle classes live in the yellow, which I can't actually see on the map. But let's have a quick zoom in to life up here around the river. So let's zoom in. Here's uh, the Thames. Uh, this is a typical sort of square, such as the one in um, Cavendish Square, where Dr. Lanyon lives. And you can see all the grand properties around the square, but then just behind them, these places of poverty. Um, and black is the darkest poverty. Uh, again, you can see black and red mixed together. Victorian London was typical this way, with the, the rich constantly exposed to people living in really terrible um, conditions. And that would make it really easy for someone like Hyde to exploit them. Well, let's take a look now at Soho itself. And um, Stevenson chooses Soho deliberately because it's a pla the place that embodies this idea of duality. So these bits of information come from judithflanders.co.uk. For most of the 19th century, it was a dark industrial um, region that serviced the spectacular front stage of the West End Pleasure Zone. So if you think about the West End and all the theatres, this is where the rich would go. But just behind the theatres, you would get these um, areas full of criminals, prostitutes, um, gin palaces, bars, uh, where the rich would go to indulge in their pleasures, but very often these pleasures would be corrupt. And that's what attracts Hyde to the location. Between 1890 and 1939, the industries that thrived on dance, music, food, fashion and commercial sex transformed their artisans' hinterland into a tourist mecca. So just after um, 1885, when our novella is written, it becomes a tourist area. Uh, so at the time that Stevenson's writing, we can imagine that lots of Londoners, rich Londoners, are going there. Um, but not necessarily other people um, from outside London. At the end of the 19th century, the great new thoroughfares of Charing Cross Road and Shaftesbury Avenue created a twilight zone where the rules didn't quite apply. And that would be even more so before um, those roads were put in. That twilight zone, if you like, of corruption and prostitution and crime would have extended even to those areas as well. And now this bit's really interesting. An area where to be foreign was the norm. Only about 4% of Londoners were foreign born in 1900, and that'll probably be similar in 1885. Whereas in Soho, 40% were foreign born residents. This gives it an added element of danger in Stevenson's time, but also part of its attraction where you can go and find people different to yourself. Uh, so Soho thus becomes both foreign and English, and that links into our idea of duality. Um, old-fashioned and modern, again, the idea of duality. And this 
much more closely links with a novel, safe and dangerous, um, respectable and criminal. Okay, well, let's see how this actually pans out in the novella. So this is Utterson's uh, view of Soho. It was by this time about nine in the morning and the first fog of the season. And Stevenson deliberately clouds Soho in fog so that we can't see its true nature. Um, and so its duality can be revealed. A great chocolate coloured pall lowered over heaven. So immediately it's sinister. Uh, heaven, a symbol of goodness, is cut out by cloud. The cloud is in a metaphor, or the fog is in the metaphor, of a pall. The pall would be a cover on a coffin, so again suggestive of death. And remember, um, Utterson has gone to Soho because this is where Hyde goes once he's killed um, Sir Danvers Carew. But we've got duality going on here. Um, instead of this being a black uh, pall, which we'd expect, it's described as chocolate, deeply attractive in its imagery. And Stevenson is suggesting that um, Soho is deeply attractive to these corrupt inhabitants of London who um, appear appalled by this kind of um, uh, criminality and prostitution, but are actually drawn to it for their pleasures and thrills. But the wind was continually charging and routing these embattled vapours, so that as the cab crawled from street to street, Mr. Utterson beheld a marvellous number of degrees and hues of twilight. Again, hues of twilight is sinister and suggestive of the criminality and immorality of this part of London, but Utterson also sees it as marvellous and therefore attractive. So this duality of nature doesn't just exist in, in Jekyll, Stevenson is suggesting it exists in all these middle-class men. Um, and if we just flick back to this uh, description of the cab drive, it's having to crawl from street to street because Soho is absolutely packed. So obviously not just its residents, but the people who come there to seek their pleasures are thronging there in great numbers, even though it's only about nine in the morning. So this subtle description shows us how corrupt London is, that it, uh, Soho is drawing in so many people. For here it would be dark, like the back end of evening, and there would be a glow of rich lurid brown. But again, that duality is playing out in the description. So uh, the sinister elements are dark and lurid brown, but that's contrasted with a glow of its attraction. Um, so we can see all the way through this description that uh, Soho is being presented as a place that's both horrifying and attractive to the hypocritical, corrupt Londoners. Uh, the description carries on. The dismal quarter of Soho, seen under these changing glimpses, with its muddy ways and slatternly passengers, and its lamps which had never been extinguished or had been kindled afresh to combat this mournful reinvasion of darkness, seemed in the, in the lawyer's eyes like a district of some city in a nightmare. So here we still get that duality, uh, darkness, nightmare, um, muddy ways, slatternly passengers. There's a, a hint of dirt there and uh, pedestrians selling sex, for example. Um, these are all horrible, but look at the description. The lamps there have never been extinguished. That's a symbol of life uh, and you can't put it out. Or they had been kindled afresh, in other words, were always renewing themselves. So there's something really attractive and powerful about this place, even though it's horrifying um, to Utterson. We can also see that that description of it as being 40% um, foreign is still true. And look at the attractions that are there. There's a gin palace, a low French eating house, so we've got foreign food, a shop for the retail of penny numbers. These are the penny dreadfuls I mentioned in uh, my previous video. Very cheap salads, foods, but contrast that with ragged children, like they obviously like beggars. Many women of different nationalities passing out. Notice he focuses on the women here, not the men. Again, suggesting um, prostitution or at least um, women who would resort to sex when they were poor, 
if you know prostitution wasn't their main form of income and lots of dis different nationalities this is presented not as something um disgusting but as something attractive um and what are they doing they're going out to have a morning glass well the only uh, place to drink that we've had described is the gin palace uh, and so it suggests that these are women of loose morals who are going to get drunk um, and probably because they need to be selling their bodies for sex and it's a deeply unpleasant experience for them they'd rather be drunk than sober to do it um, the next moment the fog settled down again upon that part as brown as umber and cut him off from his blackguardly surroundings um, which is quite interesting so when the fog comes down Utterson is cut off from what is horrible um, and can imagine that it's still um, a, a, an attractive part of London and again that's the duality at work this was the home of Jekyll's favorite of a man who was heir to a quarter of a million sterling um, this again hints at the corruption what draws Utterson there is the opportunity to rescue some of that money at least subconsciously now interestingly this is in contrast to Jekyll's house but not as much of a contrast as you would expect Dr Lanyon for example lives in Cavendish Square as I mentioned earlier a grand part of London but Dr Jekyll's house although grand in itself is already in a street that is becoming um, less reputable uh, potentially criminal and the uh, description of the house mimics the um, character of Jekyll round the corner from the by street there was a square of ancient handsome houses handsome is also a, a word used to describe Jekyll when we first meet him and now for the most part decayed from their high estate so there's high estate is um, a description of how grand the houses are but it's also a description of Jekyll's moral high ground that he was once on but that has now been decayed by his experimentation in changing himself into Hyde uh, it's now let in flats and chambers to all sorts and conditions of men and don't forget this is a novel attacking men so it is in some senses bit of a feminist text because all the hypocrisy that's described is a male impulse it's men who are hypocrites it's men who are using these um, criminal areas to indulge their criminal desires or at least their deeply immoral desires um, it's very interesting that it, uh, women are seen as completely innocent in this novel um, but men are all seen as potentially guilty map engravers architects shady lawyers and the agents of obscure enterprises one house however second from the corner was still occupied entire and at the door of this which wore a great air of wealth and comfort so this is Jekyll's part of the house though it was now plunged in darkness symbolically suggesting how Jekyll himself has become morally dark because he's given in to his evil desires except for the fanlight mr utterson stopped and knocked a well-dressed elderly servant opened the door um, and so this is there to give us an impression of jekyll's wealth uh, because that means that his level of hypocrisy is also uh, shared by the wealthy so what we've seen is that the duality in jekyll has been reflected in the duality of soho which has also been reflected in the duality of London with um, the poor and the rich mixing together so closely and then it's further reflected in the um, symbolic description we've got of Dr Jekyll's house here is a modern picture of Cavendish Square uh, the housing would be exactly what was present in Stevenson's time and what's really interesting is this is the only actual address that we get um, for the respectable characters so this is where Lanyon lives um, we can see that image of respectability um, whereas Jekyll has deliberately chosen to live somewhere which is already becoming um, much less respectable because that's um, 
a clue that Stevenson wants us to see Jekyll himself as less respectable than Dr. Lanyon. And then this can be contrasted with the kind of scene, sorry it's such a blurred photograph, that we'd expect in the streets of Soho. So very narrow streets, people living cheek by jowl, um, shopkeepers and businesses with all their wares out on the streets and people funneling through in crowds. Um, you can see the attraction of the place and uh, you can see its symbolic value in suggesting that Londoners are hypocritical and drawn to pleasure-seeking, immorality, uh, prostitution and criminality. And finally, um, Stevenson is Scottish but deliberately chooses to set his novella in London because London has the highest population of his readers but also uh, has so many of these areas where the corruption is obvious. Um, you know, well-to-do people living in gentrification but living cheek by jowl um, with high degrees of poverty and deprivation. And it's this setting which makes um, the Penny Dreadfuls, these studies of sensational crime, so attractive because Londoners feel it happening around them, not elsewhere in distant parts of London, but in their neighbourhood streets. So, uh, well done for getting to the end of the video. Uh, good luck with your revision. And don't forget to subscribe.